we're in for a treat. From couch to world champion speaker. Let me introduce Thea, the reading of the bio for Dr. Morgan McArthur, who is our speaker for this session. Dr. Morgan McArthur's life path has been more zigs and zags than Frankenstein's appendectomy chart. He's been a large animal veterinarian in the cowboy culture of the American West. He once bested 10,000 other speakers to become Toastmaster International World Champion of Public Speaking. Now this is the part that I find phenomenal. He has completed five Ironman triathlons. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> pharmaceutical research vet in New Zealand for a decade. He has been speaking professionally for over a dozen years and has shared his speaking platform with Nobel Prize winners, Olympic gold medalists, and national heroes. You're in for a treat. You know, to the side of your seat, you'll see seat belt because this is amazing. Dr. Morgan McArthur.
and we're endeavoring to solve that problem in-house. And then almost as an afterthought, they said, and Toastmasters is an inexpensive, inexpensive alternative. I said, inexpensive? Alternative. <laughs> Fancy this, friends. That was on a Friday night. On Saturday morning in the Idaho Post Register, there's a column about local events and the Rise and Shine Toastmasters Club had just elected officers and it told about the new officers and it told where they met. Woohoo! Couldn't have asked for anything better. And so I walked through that door. Well, I didn't walk through with that kind of steel. It was kind of like, <laughs> can't smell the toast burning. What's going on? <laughs> and the first guy to greet me at the door was a man named Marvin Klein. Now, Marvin would be significant throughout this arc that I'm going to describe. Mark was the very first man to meet, and he was larger than life and full of enthusiasm, past international director for Toastmasters International, which meant absolutely nothing to me, because I knew nothing about this organization. But he was regarded in the community as Mr. Toastmaster. He was a big guy. He came from a place called Hog Shooter, Oklahoma. Hi, welcome to Toastmasters. And we were off to the races. You know, Toastmasters has got this program called Moments of Truth. And, and Marvin Klein, before that program was even implemented, was the embodiment of Moments of Truth. I mean, it could have gone either way. As we all know from having walked into our first Toastmasters meeting, whatever propels us through that door, you know that it's going to be made or break by that first experience. Well, Marvin made it for me. So we were off to the races. Now, I've identified that I had a need. I was scared of public speaking. I was working with a guy I didn't like who was better than me. I could not stand to be second best to Scott Morrison. And Toastmasters was going to create the perfect storm. The perfect storm was this. It was, there, was, there was more of an issue in the background than just that. I, um... This, this, this program is titled From, From Couch to World, World Champion. And I'm, I'm going to put underneath that just a little byline that says, talent is, is myth understood. Myth understood. My wife and I had an argument last night. I don't want to invite you to my living room for a domestic, domestic situation. But we had an argument last night. She said, you have gift. And I said, I have no gift. I said, I have no gift. I am just a vanilla flavored guy who has to walk into a Toastmasters club and become activated. But the activation process was because I've only recently been able to identify the fact that I have an intense need for validation, an intense need for approval, and an intense need for applause. Where, friends, can we find a better environment for somebody who has those needs? to put somebody on the platform in front of a group and say, you've got it for five to seven minutes, and we are going to be positive, we are going to encourage you, we are going to lift you up, we are going to tell you how great thou art, raise your hands if you believe. <laughs> Hooked his, hooked his thumbs in his belt, kind of leaned back, and he said, Marvin, 
He says, I don't think you're very smart. <laughs> he says, I'll tell you what. He says, you're wasting your time in this humorous contest. He says, they'll pay you away all the way if you do the international. And I thought to myself, that's the serious speech contest. <laughs> I'm a funny guy. But I thought about it. And then he followed up and he said, you know, this is 1990, and Marvin had just returned from the International Contest in Dallas, Texas. And he came back and he says, you know, he says, I saw a young man win the International Speech Contest this year, the World Championship of Public Speaking, and he said, you remind me a lot of you. And then Marvin said, I believe you can do it. He believed in me, and maybe I didn't believe in me, but I gave Marvin sufficient credibility that maybe it was possible. But there was just one problem. In District 15, where I was hailing from, which was all of the state of Utah, the southern part of Idaho, and a sliver of Oregon, and a sliver of Wyoming, there was one problem. And it was a guy named John Howard. John Howard was a legend in District 15. As a matter of fact, he was a legend in the International Speech Contest. He had been to the final. So final five times. Five times he'd run that gauntlet and gotten on that big stage. And he nearly rang the bell in 1988 in second place. But you know what? You were never going to get past John Howard. And I knew it. And yet, I tried. Marvin's urging and the support of my club, I trust. And boy, did I take a beating every time up against John Howard. He might as well whack the upside of the head with you, but bang, bang, bang. And I learned every time from all of those beatings. And so in 1993, John Howard said, you know what, I'm frustrated with this deal. I can't seem to get it done. He said, I will choose to become a district leader, and he chose to run up the chain for district governor, essentially leaving my path wide open, baby. <laughs> and I had this bushel basket full of lessons that I had learned from this guy, the master mentor, and just pulled off, Miss Cyclist, you pulled off the front, now it's my turn. And and it was it was absolutely a, a gift that it had handed to me. Again, everything seems to be lining up. Amazing. Push pause on, on, on that story for just a moment. And in 1993 as well, I had attended the National Speakers Association Convention in San Jose, California. And I sat in an audience with a guy named Luke Heckler. Can you imagine being a professional speaker with a last name Heckler? I didn't know this guy from the bar of soap, but just looked good in the, in, the, in, the, in the program, looked like a great description, set his program, and transformed my speaking style. You have to transform my speaking style in that presentation he called, in fact, have impact. Lou is married to a woman who's a fiction writer. He's thinking, sorry, <laughs> There's always a hazard sitting in the front row. <laughs> I, I have a little expectoration. If, if you're wondering in the back, you pick what's going on up here. I'm getting a little too enthusiastic. I have this mustache, so it'll trap some of that, but if I get too much going on, I'm going to fly up here. <laughs> Heckler's wife is, is a fiction writer. He himself loved words. And the point of his program was tell stories, and not just tell stories, but, but, but say your stories in a way that they can see your stories. And when he started to relate this, I looked at him like a dog does the first time he sees a ceiling fan. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it started to make more sense to me. And it unlocked me in a very special way, because I'm just a vanilla flavor cup. I, I have led a life that is, is pretty safe. It's inside a cozy, cozy little zone, and, and it's all just kind of easy. You know, none of us likes to go, don't like to go outside of that zone too far, not by it hurt me a little bit. 
So that's been my life. And I realized, hang on, I have had experiences, as have we all, that we think in the moment, you think this is, this is just life. And yet, it moves us somehow. It moves us somehow, and one of the secrets to me about speaking, not contest speaking necessarily, but about speaking in general is accepting our stories as being powerful enough. A friend of mine named David Brooks, who won that contest in 1990, has said, that which is most personal is most universal. So we've got our stories, we've got our instances, and Luke Heckler essentially stuck the key in the lock and said, your stories are good enough, but tell them in such a way that you can transport people. Whoa. Transport people. And tell your stories in a vivid enough way that they'll be transported along, and it creates space for somebody else to get out of their story, maybe into your story, and when they make that transition, all of a sudden, hang on, there's some space there they can think differently. So I walked out of that session with stretch marks around my ears. This is not a receding hairline. This is just too much knowledge in the brain. <laughs> I walked out of that session and, and I thought, wait a second, from here on out, I'm going to tell stories in such a way that maybe people can see things a little bit different. So, the contest run is, has begun in 1993. John Howard has is pulled out of my way, and I'm free, I'm free to do what I need to do. So district contest comes and goes, and then it's time for the region contest, which this year, in 1993, is at Oakland, California, for region one. And I had a story that I just loved. And I thought, I'm kind of pumped about this deal. It was a, it was a speech called Driven to Dream. And, and the story starts with a, I won't share the speech because it's been so long, you <laughs> know, I can't remember it. But I can remember the gist of it. Sitting at breakfast one morning in Idaho Falls, it comes a, comes a knock at the back door early in the morning, and it's a friend that I hadn't seen for a long, long time, a guy named Henry Shafton. Henry used to be a rancher, but now he was a long haul truck driver. Great to see him, hadn't seen him for a long time. As you went, you, you welcome somebody like that into your home, don't you? He said, man, it's great to see you. Tell me what you've been up to. But you know what? He looked tired. He looked like he had been dragged through a knot hole in a picket fence backwards. I mean, his hair was messy, his bloodshot eyes. He was really tired. And he said, you know what? I've got a bit of a problem. He said, I am due in Canada tomorrow morning, which was a 12-hour drive from where we work, and he said, I can't make it. I cannot make that deadline alone. He said, I need your help. <laughs> and I looked out that window, and there was a big red Peterbilt tractor trailer driver stock truck thing on the back, and I thought to myself, Truck that my dog 
<laughs> I had to call a committee to mark this territory. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the sleeper cabs, there are two shiny chrome exhaust stacks that can stab into the slipstream as they reach for the sky. <laughs> Henry said, climb up inside. And I slid into that seat, and it's like a lazy boy. Ooh. Ooh. The dash looks like an airplane cockpit, right? Switches, gauges, lights, radios, <laughs> CD radio. <laughs> Got a steering wheel big as a mountain bike tire. <laughs> Shift your 18 speeds. You know, you got pedals on the floor that are big enough for like a size 20 shoe. Everything about a Peterbilt truck is big, right? <laughs> there. One story, one story above the asphalt was the shiny symbol of my dream. <laughs> I'll stop that story for just a second. Are you getting the descriptive bit? <laughs> Lou Hector gave that to me. I hope to give that to you. As you read fiction, fiction is black marks on a white page, and yet an author can transport us, an author can tickle our adrenal glands, an author can elevate our pulse rate and our blood pressure with nothing more than words, and we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. And I thought about that speech, and on the night, on the night at Oakland, California, it was a speech contest, and there must have been nine contestants, and I am the, the eighth one of nine. And as the contest unfolds, speech after speech after speech is starting to sound the same. You can do it! You can do it! You can do it! All right, I got it, I can do it! But you know what? I'm sitting out there, and I'm thinking, man, this speech is so different. And it's going to be a little bit funny. I don't know what's going to happen here. I was genuinely worried. So it comes showtime. Driven to dream. Morgan MacArthur. Morgan MacArthur. Driven to dream. Polite applause. So I keep looking at your watch thinking, okay, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm spooked. But I had a secret weapon. I had a secret weapon right there. Again, it comes down to things just kind of lined up. <coughs> things just kind of lined up. I had given a talk for a friend of mine who was a Boy Scout, Boy Scout leader. He said, would you come and talk to my Boy Scouts? I said, yes, I will, but we got to trade something. And John happened to own a truck salvage yard. <laughs> So John, what I want in exchange for this speech is an air horn. <laughs> John said, how big do you want it? He said, 30 inches be all right. I said, dude. <laughs> and so I had an air horn. Now, in 1993, flying on airlines is a whole lot easier than it is today. And, and I, I had my air horn. And so when I gave the description in that speech, as I just did for you, there, one story about the tarmac was the shiny symbol of my dream, and then I just pulled the shroud from the 30 inch air. <laughs> Every male in the audience went to the edge of his seat. <laughs> Instead of saying, look, I had a French show. 
Hill one day for breakfast, and uh, we went for a little ride in the semi truck, and uh, I was gone for 24 hours. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Bring it alive. Bring it alive. The beauty of the contest is, the beauty of the contest is, it's not about the hardware, it's not about the title, it's about the process. It's about looking at stuff and, and working on stuff and digging up stuff and saying, is this going to work? <coughs> is this the most effective it could possibly be? And then reworking it and working it and reworking it and flipping it over and then running it by somebody and they're saying, I don't get that part. And then go back and tear it apart again. Draft after draft after draft. All that for 900 words and for seven and a half minutes. Well, Remember my talking about my friend John Howard. John Howard, who, have become, who was once my rival and now has become my mentor. Won that contest, right? And now it's on to the big show. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the big show is going to be in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. World Championship of Public Speaking. Da -da 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 what the heck speech am I going to come up with that will top that? Which is always a dilemma. Well, you have to write three hit songs to get there. <laughs> and there's a lot of pressure. And then, oh, uh, I like that one. Uh, oh, no, no, no. And you get to the And you've got people in the audience with the script saying, hey, you're doing old material. You're done. You're all proven. <laughs> so again, I had to pull another, another bit of, of my experience. And as a veterinarian, my life was rich with, with material because I got to work with not only four-legged animals, I'm the strangest animal of all, the one on two legs. <laughs> and, and so I came up with a story about uh, <clears throat> a young horse that I helped deliver. It was a draft horse that I had helped deliver, and she survived despite all lot. She never should have survived. On three different occasions along the way, she shouldn't have survived, but she did. And my take on that was that she had a persistent spirit that persistence then was her horsepower. Yeah. I was playing with words. I was playing with words. And you know what? I was. I, I knew that I would be facing an audience of 2,000 people, and only a handful of those people could really truly appreciate how large a draft horse was. Yeah. Kind of the premise of the speech was that our dreams and our hopes and our ideas and our goals, when they start out, they start out real wobbly, real fragile. And, and, and they, they can be just like that, snuck down, right? But with the right kind of support and the right kind of persistence, they can grow into something absolutely majestic, which she did. I delivered her. She shouldn't have survived the difficult birth. She survived the difficult birth. She had nerve damage as a result of what we had to do to deliver her. She couldn't stand. She couldn't nurse. The owner asked me, second time now, she asked me to put her to sleep. <laughs> Put her to sleep, so we found a home for her, raised her up, she became just a majestic animal. I thought, how, how am I going to describe this? How am I going to dis display this to an audience, many of whom think that milk doesn't come from cows, it comes from the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had this brainwave that says, you know what, why don't I take a full-size horse on stage with me? <laughs> about persistence. <coughs> My message is about do what you need to do. And so picture this. My mentor, John Howard, is the vice president of marketing of Utah's largest bank. And the tallest building in Salt Lake City, Utah. In the corner office on the 19th floor, I'm sitting across the desk from my mentor, who's sitting there in his brilliant red tie and his white shirt and his pinstripe suit, and I said, John, this is my idea. And he listened very patiently to me. I said, I've got a group of graphic artists who will help me construct this horse out of artists' own form. We can make a life-size horse to take on stage. But a lot of people are saying no. And he thought for a minute, and then in my pocket I had the little mock-up. It was only about six inches tall. And it folded out because she was going to fold out. And I pulled it out and I said, you see, this is what I've got in mind. And he said, give me that. And there, like a kid, was the 
Vice President of Marketing of Key Bank of Utah, in his corner office, folding and unfolding, folding and unfolding this horse in his demand. Woohoo! Validation! <laughs> We're going with it! And so I had these artists build me this horse, and I had a big plywood box that I was going to transport her in, and it was just a little piece of engineering, just wonderful stuff. And and took it on stage, actually, the day before the contest. Debbie Horn, who was then the, the woman who ran the contest for Toastmasters International, came up to my hotel room and said, I hear you've got a horse in here. That's the new, but she's house trained. And she said, Morgan, she said, um, please know that, that your audience is a very conservative audience. This has never been done before. I don't think it's a good idea. Who did it anyway? <laughs> Second place. Second place. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything because the intensity of that experience only prepared me then for, for the next year's run. And the next year's run just kind of become boring uh, because it was it was three speeches and, and, and three speeches and, and a good day. It, and a good day. Not that I was the best. Because you know what, at that level, at the finals level, it's a bit of a roll of the dice. It's a bit of a roll of the dice. I love it. Oh yes, uh, of course. World champion of public speaking. Nice see that go to us. World, world, world champion. I tell us I, world champion. <laughs> but I did have a good day uh, when the speech called Stuck to a Buck, which is another veterinary story uh, that I will, I will drag the dogs and the cactus and talk to you about that. But you know what? I believe that the key to my success, three of them actually, one is, is mentors. Find somebody who's, who's better than you are and they're going to pull you along. They're going to give you the right kind of guidance. And in my case, it was Martin Klein who, who encouraged me from the very start. Past international director, he knew that he knew the gig, he knew how it all worked, and he encouraged me and said, you know what, I can see something in you that you can't see in yourself. I think you can win this contest. Seek out mentors. Seek people who, who cause you to stretch. And if, 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 if you can't quite reach it, then maybe they've got a little something to goose you. You know, maybe, maybe it's like you like the tap their shoe, boom, and you can reach it. Because that's what it's going to take. Mentors, stories. Stories are the currency of our communication as humans. Stories are, are where it's at. We are the only species who makes everything that occurs to us mean something. Our lives are, are a tapestry of stories. I can tell you that, again, I'm a, do I'm a doctor, you got to trust me. <laughs> Dogs do not tell stories. Oh, somebody, somebody always comes up to me afterwards and says, I have a really smart dog. <laughs> it's in LA. You bought him a cell phone yet? No. Not that smart. You know, dogs, dogs, when dogs nearly get hit by a car, they don't go back and tell their mates about it. They don't do that. They don't They chase the car again tomorrow. It's not a big deal. But humans, whoa, humans, we're dragging, we're dragging up stuff from childhood. You know, we're dragging up. the imagination, we activate what's possible with stories. And frankly, for me, I joined Toastmasters in 1987. The one thing that I have learned through this fantastic organization is that this journey is all about, about finding ourselves and accepting ourselves and, and, and saying, you know what? I am good enough and I have something of value and I'm going to share it. I'm going to share it. Story. And they're tall. And, and you know what? Our stories are good enough. I've never climbed Everest. I haven't yet cured cancer. I'm working on it. I think I've almost got it. <laughs> None of that stuff. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a guy. Trying, trying to make it happen. Trying to get through it. And, and making observations along the way. The beauty of being a speaker. <laughs> is every bad experience is a good story. <laughs> somebody, 
Steve Allen, a, a, a comic from way back, said, tragedy plus time equals comedy. You know? I, I spoke in District 42 up in uh, Saskatchewan two weeks ago. And, and I fell out there's a tragedy plus time equals humorous speech. True story. What we, what we gain from this organization is confidence, and we gain a lot of things, but, but we also gain awareness. The stories, the stories flow in and out of our lives just like that. And, and if we're aware enough to catch them, we grab them. I'm always carrying my little black book because I'm old, my hard drive is full, I gotta write stuff down. And I'll grab stories, if it moves you, it will move somebody else. It's all a matter of the interpretation and what we attach to. So mentors, stories, and then and then hard work. There's, there's no way around it. It's, it's about wordsmithing. It's about practice. I, in Idaho Falls, I live adjacent to a gravel pit that was owned by a concrete company. And, and the concrete company made uh, <coughs> prefabricated portions of bridges. And if one was busted up or didn't quite make grade, it got thrown into the gravel pit, and that was my stage. It was me and the robots. I'd go out there and, and, and practice, and practice, and practice, imagining that gravel pit to be the big space that, that ultimately you'll be on as, as a finalist. I imagined that to be the big space, and that, and that uneven piece of concrete was my stage. And work it, and work it, and work it, and be in touch with my mentors, and wordsmith, and tweak it, and you've got 900 words. And it comes down to, can I get my message across, and am I massaging syllables, cutting stuff down and you're, you know, the audience is, 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 you start telling your story. Here's a little deal about story. We tell stories and we think the audience is going to get word for word for word. No way. They're on a parallel railroad track. They're telling their own stories in their heads about somebody they know or something that happened to them. Did you ever drive a semi? Well, no. Did you ever want to drive a semi? Well, no. Have you ever had a dream? Oh, yeah. And they're going down the parallel track and, and I've got the arrogance and the ego to think, you know what, my story's more important. But now I've got the maturity and the age and the wisdom. You know, my story doesn't mean nothing. You're going on your own story as we go down this track. Hopefully, at the end, we come to the same place. And it's all, all about dreams. It's all about what happens. All of that takes a lot of work. The contest, um, the contest is, is a great experience. Me when I was when I was pursuing it, it was all about the hardware, it was all about the title. But you know what? That was all about that ultimate attention-seeking behavior. True story. You know, if I could achieve that, maybe I'd do something special. Um, it, it, it really is. It really is. It's, it's a neat experience, and it's it's a neat journey, and it's done neat things for me. But that's really not what it's all about. The real prize is what you get as a result. Uh, self-awareness along that journey. The destination doesn't matter, it's the journey. Here's an example. This, this to me is, is a treasure. I've been coaching a woman from Des Moines, Iowa, and I, I don't do a lot of that. She approached me and I said, yeah, you know what, we don't work stagecraft, we work what we call backstory. Why are you trying to tell the story? What is it that you want to achieve? What do you want to get across to the audience? We spent a lot of time on that stuff, and she came away saying, well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't. I said, that'll take care of itself. And so here's the little thank you note know, that I got. I'm going to share it with you, because this is a treasure. Because it tells me that she gets it. She says, dear Morgan, I forgot to send a proper thank you note earlier. Thanks for the great coaching session, blah, blah, blah. I feel like I'm growing by leaps and bounds. I'm learning to push my boundaries more. You know what? We do our own thinking. We think that this is the boundary. Mentor has got a vibrant footprint right on, on the right cheek of your butt. Boom! 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 That's what it's really all about, is to push you out of that zone where you think, well, this is all I can do. Mm. And at the end, she said, no matter what happens, I walk away a better speaker. Winner. It sounds cliche. It sounds cliche when you say, you know what? We're all winners tonight. Well, yeah, but there's three trophies. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 for the experience and for the investment of yourself and ultimately what you learn along that process, everybody's a winner. Because you
you're bigger, better, fitter, faster, more aware. It's groovy. I'm going to close my piece with, with a quote that I had hanging on my wall. There's the pink from the lady in red. <laughs> I'm going to close with this quote and then I'll, ask, I'll, I'll invite questions. This, this quote I had, a calligrapher put this on my wall because it really sums up a big part of my experience. It's by uh, W. H. Murray, who uh, led the Scottish expedition on Everest. And he said, the moment one definitely commits oneself to providence, moves to a whole stream of events, issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance. Material assistance. The horror. Woo! Which no man could have dreamt would have come his way. I learned a deep respect for one of Goethe's couplets, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness as genius power and magic in it. Start the journey. Don't necessarily have your eyes on the prize out there as a piece of something that's going to sit on your, on your mantle. The prize is here. And the journey will help you discover the magic that is within you. And from that, I'll invite you questions. How much time do I have for questions, young lady? Do I have any? Five minutes. There's the first. Yes, ma'am. Do you write out and memorize, or do you merely outline and find it? Beautiful question. The question was, do I write out it? Do I or did I? Did I? I did. Every word was written out and memorized. And it's a scary place. It's a scary place because you think, oh, if I get off, if I get off script, undo. Uh, 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 Any contest, you've got the speakers who are twistly prepared. <laughs> Gesturing. It's all going on, right? It's all crisply choreographed and worked and, and good on you for investing the effort. And then what happens in the interview? <laughs> oh man, we're comfortable, fresh is off, we're human, it's all going on. How many times have I watched the contest and said, why don't you do that? Speaking to me is a conversation. It's a conversation on purpose, and it's an amplified conversation. It's not dialogue necessarily, but we get nods, and we get, you know, when it's not working, because somebody's texting in the back of the room. It's a conversation. We all just want conversation. Think of the dynamic. We're all sitting around, we're having a chat, and then, and then all of a sudden somebody says, and now it's time for the presentation. Whoa, dynamic changes, doesn't it? I think the closer, the shorter we can make that distance you know. between the front seat and then standing up and more comfortable and more gives us joy. The contest doesn't work that way necessarily, but ultimately, this is where we want to be. Just Truth trumps technique. I believe this. 
part of a little snippet of my backstory is I grew up in an alcoholic home. Hence the, the overachiever, and hence, hence the, the attention seeker. Wasn't getting it from my parental figure, so man, I was looking for it somewhere. I was going to get it somewhere. And I now go to a 12-step program. And I'm not doing it with my therapy on the platform, but I go to a 12-step program and I'm sitting there in, in an audience of folks who have hit bottom. And the stories that they tell are just stunning. And you know what? There is no one of them that's trained as a public speaker. And yet, my jaw is wide open. I go, holy cow. And I realize if we are willing to be vulnerable and to tell our truth, there is something in, in every listener's subconscious that is tuned in to is he or she telling me the truth? And, and there's just a vibration that happens. You know it, you, you, you can't label it, but you just know it. So I believe being yourself and telling the truth as you know it. That, that, would, be, that would be my response to that question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.